Now, if you're after a new smartphone and it's proper quality optics that you desire, well, don't stress about splashing out on some fancy pants flagship. Because for less than half the price of an iPhone 14 or some Samsung S series shenanigans, you can get yourself a quality blower with a camera that is great for shooting the whole fam. I've reviewed dozens of these budget blowers and here's my pick of the best right now. And for more on the latest and greatest tech, please do pog subscribe and ding that notifications bell. Cheers! So one of the most obvious choices for around the £400 mark is Google's own Pixel 6a, a compact 6.1 incher which has only improved since upgraded to Android 13. But it's the camera wizardry which really helps it to stand out against rival smartphones. Now 12.2 meg primary setup comes with built-in optical image stabilisation and it's ideal for snapping anything and everything your gorgeous little heart desires. It's a real point and shoot effort. Just aim the camera in generally the right direction and that's about all the brain power you'll need to get good looking photos. If you're struggling against a bright background or some other HDR shenanigans, you can manually tweak the exposure levels with a quick swipe of your finger. An easy alteration for even better results. Google's cameras are masters when it comes to capturing colours just as they look in real life, even when the light is a bit pants. And night sight is fully automatic these days, so as long as you keep your hands still for a second or so, you'll get bright pics that aren't plagued by noise. And unlike most other manufacturers, Google does only serve up a very small selection of bonus camera modes and tools to play around with. So for instance, there's no pro mode to speak of, but there is a portrait mode that can be depended on to keep your subject crisp while smudging out the background. And the Pixel 6a also gives you the option of a 12 meg ultra wide shooter, which unlike most rivals can once again capture pretty natural looking snaps. Colours aren't distorted too much beyond a slight deepening of those bright blue skies and so on. For your home movies, you can shoot 4K video at 30 or 60 frames per second. And again, I approve of the stuff that this thing churns out. Vivid colours are again captured in full glory with plenty of details stuffed into every frame. Image stabilisation impresses, keeping the picture as still as possible even when you're walking at pace or piddling about on a boat. And any voices chatting around the phone are cleanly picked up even against full on background noise. It's only when things get a bit darker that the Pixel 6a struggles, serving up quite murky results overall. Now the only real disappointment with the old Pixel 6 camera setup was the selfie camera which proved frustratingly limited compared with the rear optics. Hence, I didn't exactly have high expectations when it came to snapping my mug with the Pixel 6a. Thankfully, this selfie shooter is actually pretty good, even when you move indoors into quite dingy spaces, as long as you and any fellow selfies aren't flapping about the place. It's not too phased by high contrast shenanigans either, and again, like video capture, it's not until things get proper dark that it all gets a bit murky and not very nice to look at. And if you want to shoot a vlog or something with that front facing camera, it's full HD resolution capture, no 4K option sadly. It's quite zoomed in as well and you don't have an option to zoom out, just zoom in even further, which oh, nobody needs that. Another cracking choice is the Nothing Phone 1, which may have stolen headlines with its flashy disco arse, but it's actually a solid all-rounder for a similar price to the Pixel. It's got impressive game and grunt, a similar stock Android vibe and some capable camera tech headed up by Sony's IMX 766 sensor, which is found in an awful bloody lot of 2022 smartphones. And more often than not, this does a great job. Although some of my recent picks on the Nothing Phone still occasionally look rather soft as if the focus didn't quite get its sh** together in time. The Nothing Phone handles HDR situations well, capturing a good amount of detail in darker areas without blowing out the lighter bits and a bright blue sky will often look exactly that rather than washed out. And likewise, I haven't seen any kind of lens flare or any other bugger about tree when I've been shooting in harsh lighting. The Nothing Phone is also a blinder when it comes to portrait shots, even when you're dealing with fast moving subjects. Although weirdly, it now seems to take a wee while to process some portrait snaps, remaining completely unresponsive until it's all done. And that's something I didn't notice at all when the phone was first released, so maybe it's been introduced by one of these little updates. The Nothing Phone sadly doesn't perform as admirably in lower light despite the optical image stabilisation. You'll see plenty of grain and noise creeping into your pics, not to mention blur with any kind of motion despite claimed improvements in this area. And that focus definitely struggles more in lower light too. I often had to manually override it with a poke of the screen. Still, you've always got the option to absolutely blind your subject with those glyphs if you want to light the buggers up. The 50 meg ultra wide angle lens uses Samsung's GN1 sensor and you'll get some distortion around the edges of your photos and the usual colour morphing, but the actual picture quality is almost as good as any images taken with the main sensor. 
This is more prone to saturation in brighter light and not as capable in dimmer conditions, but it is still one of the better ultra wide shooters at this price point. Video can be recorded at up to 4K resolution, although if you do stick it on that Ultra HD level, you are stuck at 30 frames per second, there's no 60 FPS option. And for the first week or two that I spent with this smartphone, all of my footage looked almost cartoon-like thanks to the artificial colour boost, but thankfully one of these updates has sorted the problem right out, and now the Nothing Fold captures more natural luck in action. Image stabilisation is good enough to work against any shakes and bumps if you're moving and recording simultaneously, and audio capture is perfectly respectable, as long as there's no actual wind or anything. You could also use the ultra wide camera to shoot video, but you'll have to select this before you start recording, as you can't switch midway through, and again the results are fine as long as the conditions aren't taxing. Up front you've got a 16 meg Sony sensor for your selfie shots, and again this is pretty good even in quite strong light. You'll get plenty of detail packed into every pick, no masking of those lines and creases at all, and the portrait smarts are also up to snuff, although like the main camera things do get soft in lower light. Next up the Realme 9 Pro Plus which boasts some pretty impressive specs and another dependable camera for a very respectable price. The primary camera sensor is a 50 megapixel Sony IMX766 with built-in optical image stabilisation and this really does capture impressive photos for this price point. It's a step up from many rivals. In strong light you'll occasionally get a bit of saturation but the Realme 9 Pro Plus can cope admirably with sharp contrast. These test shots serve up more detail than the competition, especially in the darker areas. Even indoors the detail levels don't noticeably drop while colour reproduction is still close to natural. In ambient light, moving subjects do occasionally look fuzzy, if they are in motion that's no real surprise. Oh and just a minor random aside, never ever get a chocolate orange beer, even if it's just a quid, it's kind of like an umpa lumpa just threw up in a can. The Realme 9 Pro Plus's 8 megapixel ultra wide lens also doesn't shock, struggling to produce as natural looking results as the primary sensor, but it's handy for fitting more into the frame. And yes, Realme, like Xiaomi and many others, feels obligated seemingly to slap a macro lens on the back end of its smartphones as well, so uh, yeah, you've got one of those here too, yippee hooray celebrations. You've also got a big old bag of bonus modes including a night mode which can brighten up your subject effectively as long as they're completely still of course. And there is a full on pro mode on here as well if you want to tinker with all of the settings and get a very precise kind of shot. For your home movies you can record 4K video at 30 frames per second and that's the setting that I stuck with. And even if colour reproduction isn't exactly entirely natural you will get sharp visuals as well as clear audio from all directions. Images do get a little softer indoors and in the evenings, pretty typical from mid-range mobiles but nothing too shocking. And even the stabilisation isn't actually dreadful at that 4K resolution when you're bopping along and shooting simultaneously. And last up if you're an Instagram fan, that 16 meg selfie shooter isn't anything special but it'll do the job as long as again you aren't testing it with any particularly troublesome conditions. However, if you do want to shoot a bit of video using that front facing camera, it does max out at full HD resolution and you know the quality is absolutely fine. Again, the audio pickup is all right. Nothing particularly stunning on the visuals side of thing, but it's fine for a bit of basic vlogging. Another option is the Poco F4, a mighty fine phone for a rather affordable asking price. You got beefy performance, perfect for gaming, even though the chipset carries over from the F3. While movie fans can enjoy their flicks on a big, bold, beautiful 6.67 inch AMOLED screen. Now like the Poco F4 GT model, you once again have a 64 meg main camera sensor with optical image stabilisation to help out with your low light snaps. A few of my shots taken indoors for instance came out quite soft and warm and things can still get pretty fuzzy if your subject isn't completely still. But overall the Poco F4 performed admirably for a mid-range mobile. In better lighting I got some pretty vivid photos with striking colour reproduction, but nothing too phony thankfully. Blue skies in particular come out really well, so it's just a shame we don't see them more often here in the UK. No complaints with the amount of detail packed into every frame either, despite the pixel binning. Photos still look crisp enough when you check them out on an oversized monitor. And I really enjoyed the results I got from the portrait mode as well, which doesn't bulk up very often at all. An 8 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter is also available on the back end of the Poco F4 if you want to add a bit of drama to your shot or you simply just can't fit everything into frame. The detail levels aren't as fine, colours take a bit of a hit and the ultra wide does struggle more in lower light but it's all pretty typical for a mid-range mobile. 
And also like most other mid-range mobiles, the final lens in that triple lens setup isn't a telephoto shooter, it's your bog standard basic two megapixel macro shooter way. But using the primary camera, you do have a 64 meg max resolution mode that you can swap to and then crop into your photos to get a sort of fake zoom effect. It's obviously not as good, but it does work in a pinch if the lighting isn't cack. And of course, pretty standard with Poco and Xiaomi smartphones, you've got a sackload of other bonus camera modes you can play around with, including a full-on pro mode with raw support, if that's your bag. Plus there's a video mode naturally, which can capture clips at up to 4K resolution at either 30 or 60 frames per second. In low light, the results ain't too hot, lots of focal pop and noise to contend with, but the Poco F4 again copes pretty well with strong light and sharp contrast. Image stabilization is decent at the 4K setting, there's not too much shake when you are moving and shooting at the same time, and the audio pickup is absolutely fine as well. As for the F4's 20 meg selfie shooter, well that's alright, I got the occasional saturated pick when I was shooting outside if I wasn't too careful with my angles, but the camera can generally deal well with strong contrast. And again, colours are warm indoors and you want to keep as still as possible in low light so things don't get too blurry, but apart from that, all good. And you can shoot full HD video if you want to using that selfie cam. I certainly had no complaints when I was Skyping or Zooming with this smartphone. No one was complaining that they couldn't hear me properly or they couldn't see me properly either. Again, it deals pretty well with uh, quite strong contrast on occasion. And in quite low light, it's not terrible either. Another good in now that it's dropped in price is Xiaomi's 11 Lite 5G NE. It's another all-round cracker boasting a Dolby Vision display, incredible battery life and a competitive bit of camera tech. The 64 megapixel primary sensor can grab 16 meg snaps and while the picture quality can't quite touch rivals such as the Pixel 4a and again that A52s 5G, it's not half bad. Shoot something in decent light and you'll enjoy realistic colours and fine detailing in your photo as long as you leave that AI mode well alone. Even in more ambient light, the results are decent if you're not trying to shoot anything in motion, so kittens and sugared up kids are right out. And the night mode doesn't do a huge amount to boost the brightness when the lighting is crap, but it does make a small difference. And as usual with Xiaomi smartphones, you've got plenty of other bonus modes to play around with here, including good old pro mode of course if you want to tinker with the white balance all that shenanigans. And a portrait mode that does a great job with living subjects and disembodied mannequin heads smearing out all of that background clutter so they really stand out. The Xiaomi 11 Lite 5G NE also serves up an 8 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter that, like most ultra wide angle lenses, sacrifices tonal accuracy for a broader scope. And yes, you've got a 5 megapixel telemacro lens if you want to shoot weird close ups. For all your video needs, this mobile can record up to 4K resolution footage at 30 frames per second. And again, I was happy enough with the results. As long as that lighting holds up, the visuals are sharp enough so you can enjoy your footage on a big screen, while the audio capture is also nice and clear. And the 20 megapixel selfie shooter will do a decent enough job as long as you do two things. Turn off that stupid beautify bollocks and avoid strong light as you'll just end up with oversaturated results. Otherwise it's perfectly fine with excellent portrait smarts. Next up is Samsung's Galaxy A53 5G, which suffers from juddery performance but it's good in almost every other way. You've got pretty much the same One UI experience as the S22 flagships, respectable battery life and another absolute banger of a Samsung display. Now another area where the A53 mostly impressed me was that 64 megapixel primary shooter with built-in OIS. Given enough light you will get accurate colours, rich textures and crisp detail in all of your test shots. These things look good even when viewed back on a telescreen. And even with pretty strong contrast it is rare to have a seriously saturated pick. And while the focus isn't the fastest around, as I mentioned before, I never found I had any fuzzy, out of focus photos after a full week of testing. Move indoors or to more ambient light and the colours do take a bit of a hit, but the A53 still captures impressively fine detail. Just make sure your subject isn't moving about as they'll probably end up looking like some sort of blurry David Lynchian nightmare. And in the evenings this blow does an alright job as well, with a dedicated night mode to help out when needed. As usual, you've got a selection of bonus modes to play with, including an excellent portrait mode that once again allows you to tweak the bokeh strength after you've taken the shot. You've also got a food mode which boosts the colours massively and does indeed make your Greg sausage roll or whatever look more appetising if you want to reminisce about what you had for lunch. My own favourite, however, is definitely Samsung's single take mode, which once again is back in action here on the Galaxy A53. This is ideal for owners of cats or kids or whatever for whenever you can't decide whether to take photos or capture a bit of video of them in action. 
And the A53 also offers up a 12 megapixel ultra wide angle lens, which does a reasonable job with color reproduction and doesn't distort things too badly. Definitely a handy option when you need to fit a lot into frame. And then the rest of the camera setup is rounded off with a simple macro lens and a depth sensor as well. Video can be shot at up to 4K Ultra HD resolution at 30 frames per second, or you can keep it at full HD at 30 or 60 FPS. This here is all 4K footage, and once again, I'm pretty happy with the results here. Outdoors, you'll find yourself getting good looking clips with clear audio pickup all around the phone. And while the quality of the images does drop when the lighting is in short supply, it's still not bad. Last up, around front, you've got a 32 meg selfie snapper, and this works well in a range of conditions. A little too well, actually, because it clearly picks up all the wrinkles and sags and grey hairs when you knock off that annoying beautify bollocks. You've got a wide enough view to fit in a couple of fellow human beings with portrait mode smarts to really help you stand out. And the good news for any wannabe vloggers or what have you out there is you can actually shoot 4K Ultra HD video footage using that 32 meg selfie snapper, and the vocal pickup is really strong as well. Another favourite of mine is the OnePlus Nord 2T, which once again sports a slick AMOLED screen, smooth everyday performance and dependable battery life. Slapped on that arse is yet another 50 megapixel Sony IMX766 camera sensor, and it's once again a good un in more circumstances. Most of my test photos look pretty natural, with vibrant colours when appropriate and enough sharp details so they look good on a proper big telly screen. The focus is fast to react and rarely messes up, even when the subject is in motion. At night, you still get attractive looking pics with that IMX 766 sensor, even without employing OnePlus's dedicated nightscape mode. That's possibly helped along by the Dimensity processor's upgraded abilities. Things have to be really dim before you finally get some grain and ugly stuff creeping into your shots. Indoor snaps do tend to come out quite warm, but again with impressive detail considering they were spaffed out by a mid-range mobile. Oh, and by the way, you are very welcome for this here horrific nightmare fuel, which comes courtesy of that mental Google event. All I can say is thank God I was hammered by the time I shot these photos. Now, if anything in this camera setup needed upgrading, it is definitely that 8 megapixel ultra wide angle snapper. This is okay ish for outdoor snaps with good lighting, although colours do look a bit wonky, and the results are pretty bloody dreadful once you move indoors or you try actually snapping stuff at night. You can also shoot up to 4K resolution video on the OnePlus Nord 2T, and this again does the job for your home movies, offering sharp detail, accurate colours more often than not, and strong enough stabilisation so your footage isn't reduced to a janky, shaky mess whenever you twitch your arm a bit. In lower light, things don't immediately look terrible, and the audio capture was good enough to clearly pick up and emphasise vocals both in front of and behind the camera. And finally, up front, you've got a 32 meg IMX615 sensor for shooting all of those lovely selfies. And this works fine in good light, but in more ambient conditions, you will need a steady hand to avoid blur. A steady hand I clearly didn't have after quaffing too many random vodka and tequila cocktails. If that's a little bit out of your budget, well, no worries. Alternatively, there's the OnePlus Nord CE2, where the CE bit stands for Core Edition. This slashes some of the specs to reach that more budget-friendly price, while the camera tech has been swapped out for a more basic 64 meg sensor, the same tech found on the original OnePlus Nord CE. And for this price, you get some respectable looking photos, even in quite ambient light and in harsh HDR, the OnePlus Nord CE2 stands up fairly tall. Of course, in really low light, you do get some blur and noise creeping in, but you do have a night mode to help out in these low light situations. Video can be captured at up to 4K resolution at 30 frames per second, no 60 FPS option. But again, in everything but ambient light, it stands up pretty well for your home movie action. Now, Motorola usually serves up some decent camera tech for an affordable price. For instance, a snifter under 200 of your British pounds bags you the Moto G62, whose highlights include a crisp 6.5 inch 120Hz display and a mighty 5000mAh battery, plus a pleasingly stock Android experience. Your primary sensor is a 50 megapixel effort. You've got the usual Motorola AI smarts on board when you launch that camera app. It's going to just help you to get the best possible shot, depending on obviously what your subject is. And for a tinder pound shooter, it's not bad at all. Of course, you'll have to make sure that your subject is well lit and as still as possible if they're not well lit. You get a reasonable amount of detail packed in there. There is a good bit of pixel binning going on, which just helps to brighten things up a little bit when the conditions aren't quite perfect. 
Now, as well as that 50 megapixel primary sensor, you've also got an 8 megapixel secondary ultra wide angle shooter, which as you can see there offers a more pulled back view of the action. Don't expect as much detail in these pics and of course the colours take a hit as well, but it's there if you want a different viewpoint. And when it comes to video recording as well, the Moto G62, again pretty limited, you don't have 4K resolution recording here, only full HD at either 30 or 60 frames per second. So don't expect your footage to be absolutely packed with detail, things will look a bit grainy when beamed up to a big screen, but it's fine for simple shareable clips and everyday home movies. And then last up, flip around to the front and you've got a 16 megapixel selfie shooter housed in that little orifice up top. And again, just be mindful when you're shooting selfies with the Moto G62 because they're all limitations, don't snap yourself against any super bright skies for instance, and in particularly low light environments it doesn't exactly thrive either. And yay, verily, you can shoot full HD resolution footage on the Moto G62 using that 16 meg selfie snapper. Again, same limitations, you know, if you're doing it indoors, it's going to look a little bit grainy and cruddy if the lighting is particularly cack. The audio pickup seems absolutely fine though. If you can spare a bit more cash, the Moto G82 upgrades the display to an OLED panel while also improving the everyday performance. And that camera tech is mostly the same, but now the primary sensor has built-in optical image stabilization. A 50 meg primary sensor does a pretty decent job of everyday photos without balking the colours or you know tweaking things too much, fairly natural looking images and even in quite strong contrast it generally holds up pretty well. You know, get some little bits of saturation creeping in here and there but nothing too dramatic. Of course in more ambient light and lower light conditions it does tend to struggle a little bit more, you get softer results, bit of noise and grain creeping in but the optical image stabilisation helps to keep things as sharp as possible. You'd also have an ultra wide angle shooter that you can swap to at any point. It's a basic 8 megapixel effort and again this does fine during the day but struggles a little bit more in the evenings where you'll get murkier results. The disappointment here is that there's no support for 4K Ultra HD resolution footage. You've got Full HD plus video by default and that can be shot at 30 or 60 frames per second, but that's it. And last up around front in that little selfie orifice tucked way up at the top end of the screen there, you've got a 16 megapixel selfie shooter. This ain't bad at all for your everyday shareable, Instagrammable shots, whatever, if that's what you're into. Doesn't capture a huge amount of detail unless the lighting conditions are perfect, which in my case is actually pretty good. You can struggle a little bit in low light situations as well, but you do have a screen flash feature which is brighter than the sun, so uh, that will help out when it's night time and also give you a tan at the same time. And for shooting a video with that selfie snapper, well, no surprises that it is again topped off at full HD resolution. There's no option of 30 or 60 frames per second. This time, audio pickup seems absolutely fine again. Not great in the sort of lower light situations, but it does the job. And finally, for around 300 quid, you can always grab the Nokia G60, which comes packing years of software support, some eco-friendly design, and a 50 megapixel primary camera sensor, although sadly without any OIS built in. Nokia was unfortunately a little bit vague when it comes to exactly which camera sensor has been used in the Nokia G60, but I do know there's no optical image stabilization packed in there. But you know what, I got some really good looking photos out of this thing, packed with enough sharp details so they looked good even on a proper big screen particularly these portrait shots. Colours come out close to natural, even when you're snapping quite vibrant subjects. And while strong contrast usually results in oversaturation, the Nokia G60 does hold up well compared with some of its rivals. Indoor snaps are often a bit grainy, but again nothing too horrific. Although at night the Nokia G60 does struggle quite a bit, and while the night mode brightens things up considerably, it often can't help with the soft focus and noise. For a different kind of view, you can always swap to the basic 5 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter, and this is pretty basic stuff. It struggles in more testing conditions, but it's there if you need it. And that final end slapped on the back of the Nokia G60 is just a depth sensor for those portrait shots. Now, if you swap on over to the video mode, you will quickly discover that there's no way of shooting 4K resolution footage here. It does max out at 1080p full HD at either 30 or 60 FPS. And strong light will definitely need to be avoided at all times, otherwise the resulting footage will look, well, just like this right here, really. Same goes for night video as well. Like most of the competition, this phone just kind of falls on its arse a bit. But in good lighting, you will get respectable looking video clips with decent audio pickup and the stabilization ain't too bad either. And then last up is the 8 megapixel, I believe it is, selfie camera. This does a pretty good job in stronger light, making sure that your face is fully in focus with attractive portrait results if you want. But again, indoor shots will look rather soft and at night everything gets a bit grainy. 
And that right there is my roundup of the very best budget-friendly camera smartphones you can bag yourself right now as we waltz away merrily into a very wet, depressingly dark autumn 2022. You'll find unboxings and reviews of all of these smartphones right here on Techspert if I've piqued your interest. And if I've missed off your own personal favourite best budget camera phone, we'll definitely clue me in as to what a massive knobber I am in the comments below. Please do plug subscribe, ding that notifications bell, all the usual YouTube jazz, and have yourselves a wonderful rest of the week. Cheers, everybody. Love you.